Welcome everyone to our latest ALTA Insights webinar. Uh, these are presentations we focus on issues important to title and settlement professionals. I'm Jeremy Yoey, ALTA's Vice President of Communications. And today we've got a, a wonderful presentation lined up to, to help you uh, uh, learn how the uh, 2022 midterm elections uh, will impact Washington's policy prior priorities in the coming year. Uh, before uh, introducing uh, today's uh, main speaker, I have a, a few housekeeping items to touch on. If at any time you have a question, uh, please submit them, submit them in the questions box, and we'll hold a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be available on ALTA's website at alta.org forward slash webinars. That's alta.org forward slash webinars. And you'll also get a link to the recording in an email tomorrow. Uh, you can download a copy of the presentation in the ha handout section of the GoToWebinar window pane. And we do need to thank SoftPro for sponsoring today's Alta Insights presentation. And before introducing today's speaker, we have a short commercial from SoftPro. Introducing SoftPro Sign your one-stop solution to facilitate e-closings in SoftPro. With SoftPro Sign, all parties involved in a real estate transaction can securely sign and or notarize documents online. You can easily send out documents for e-signatures from within SoftPro 360, saving you time and costs associated with a traditional paper closing. Your customers will receive an alert letting them know they have new documents to sign. Once signed, documents are automatically returned to your SoftPro 360 queue. For remote online notarization closings, your notary can meet virtually with the signer and perform a credential analysis to ensure a secure signing. E-signing and remote online notarization have never been easier or more secure. Learn more at www.softprocorp.com sign. Okay. All right. Thank you, SoftPro. And let me uh, make you the presenter. There we go. All right. Um, now uh, it's. it's uh, I'm uh, happy to introduce today's speaker, uh, Nathan Gonzalez. Uh, Nathan is the editor and publisher of Inside Elections, uh, which provides nonpartisan analysis of campaigns for the Senate, House, Governor, and President. Uh, Nathan has offered his political insights uh, to us before. He has spoke at our ALTA Advocacy Summit and has participated in uh, our webinars in the past. So uh, after, uh, after Nathan uh, shares his analysis of what drove the results, uh, we'll also have uh, some ALTA staff who will um, offer some input on our advocacy efforts and policies that will impact your business after this presentation. So Nathan, with that, I'll turn, turn it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you to all of you for uh, for joining us. I know your time is valuable, and uh, I don't take that for granted. I also don't take it for granted because I'm wearing a tie, even though I'm sitting in my basement, because uh, I take this seriously. So um, I uh, I will I want to make a confession. Uh, since the last time we met, uh, normally I don't endorse candidates, uh, but I did endorse a candidate in a race. Um, but it was my daughter. Uh, my daughter was running for class president. She's a freshman in high school. I did endorse her candidacy. Uh, she was elected a couple weeks ago. Um, she was unopposed, so I felt pretty good about her chances. We had her in our in our likely category, in our rating category. But uh, anyway, that's not the election you came to hear about. Um, we want to talk about November, what just happened uh, a few weeks ago and what that might look like moving forward. Uh, and I will, I'm gonna run through kind of some basics about what we what we were surprised by, what we weren't surprised by, what you shouldn't have been surprised by, uh, and, uh, but I wanna leave time for questions as well. So feel free to drop those, drop those in. Uh, I'm going to uh, share a sc my screen here. Hold on one sec. Okay, hopefully you should see this momentarily. All right, Jeremy, yell at me if folks if folks can't see this. Yeah. All right, well, here's a very fancy here's a very fancy slide, folks. Um, balance of power in the in the Senate, Democrats are going to maintain control of the United States Senate. 
We don't know the margin quite yet until we get through this Georgia runoff next week, but Democrats are going to hold control in the House. Republicans are going to win the majority. Uh, there's still a couple outstanding races um, to, to know the final margin, but Republicans will take over the House of Representatives. And in governor's races, uh, Democrats will gain two governorships. There are still more Republican governors nationwide, but Democrats gained two governorships uh, uh, looking at races across the country. Um, Pre-election scenarios, many of you have seen a version of this slide before since we've been together both virtually and online. And uh, I wanted to kind of, you know, I guess it's sort of accountability or what, what we were expecting, remind us what we were expecting moving forward. Um, the, the most likely scenario was a Republican House and a Democratic Senate followed closely by a Republican House and a Republican Senate. Uh, but ultimately, the, the, in terms of control, what happened on November the 8th should not have been a big shock. I know that that was one of the narratives coming, coming uh, out of the elections is, oh, here we go again. Everything was a surprise. I'm like, Actually, there were a lot of things that, that landed where we thought they were going to be. The outstanding piece of it was the, the, uh, the margin in the House, but the overall scope of the election uh, was, should not have been a shock, particularly for those who you know, are getting the newsletter on a regular basis. Um, the third scenario that was less likely was Democratic expansion. Democrats could expand their majority in the Senate if they are able to win Georgia, hold on to Georgia. Um, Democrats aren't going to expand the majority in the House. They're, they will they will have they will be losing seats. We just don't know how many quite yet. Uh, I wanted to put President Biden's con uh, his job approval rating into a little bit of context because the broader context is that Republicans were handed a tremendous opportunity this cycle. There's an un a midterm election with an unpopular Democratic president with uncertain uh, uh, an uncertain economic times where people were concerned about the economy and inflation and cost of living and crime and immigration. A lot of things that folks were worried about, and typically that would result in big gains for the party out of power because voters are concerned with the party in power. Um, and Biden was about where uh, had the, about the same job approval rating as Trump did heading into the 2018 elections when Democrats gained more than 40 seats. He had a lower job approval rating than President Obama had in 2010 when Republicans gained 63 seats. And these are some of the historical pieces that were driving the narrative that Republicans were going to do very well in the House. Uh, and it ultimately, Republicans did do well enough to get the majority, but it was a, a squeaker. Uh, and in a way, 2020, 2022 was the inverse of 2020, meaning if we go back two years, you'll remember that Democrats held on to the House, but Republicans outperformed expectations. This cycle, Republicans gained the House, but Democrats overperformed, so did better than expectations. And when you boil this down actually to kind of what does that mean moving forward, both parties have things have positive elements to pull out of these elections that that disincentivizes change. What I mean is that voters or the parties, if if Democrats would have been crushed, right? If they would have lost the Senate, they lost. If they would have lost dozens of seats in the House, Democrats would probably be going off into the political wilderness to search for their soul. But they're not really doing that because they held the Senate and they overperformed expectations in the House. There's not that, again, there's not that incentive to make structural, ideological, or strategic decisions to make a difference, uh, different decisions on structure, strategy, and ideology if you don't feel like you, you really lost all that much. And so neither, both parties have things that they can take away. Even though Republicans didn't do as well as what they wanted to in the House, they still gained the House majority. So that's a key piece moving, moving forward. Um, we're going to do the Senate, the House, a little bit of governors, and then I promise to leave time for, for questions. All right. In the Senate, just as a reminder, um, a, in a majority of midterm elections going back a century, the president's party has lost Senate seats. Um, this cycle, Republicans or Democrats, there'll either be no bar when we add a 2022 bar at the end, or there will be a very small bar up one seat uh, for, for Democrats. So it, it will go against the trend of Repub of the party, the president's party losing Senate races. Uh, the current balance of power, well, not the current, but the 
upcoming next Congress, Democrats will have at least 50 seats, Republicans will have at least 49 seats, and then there's that one, the Georgia runoff next week. Now, it, that race is still consequential because even though it, it doesn't matter for control, like it did two years ago when both Georgia runoffs were, um, Democrats needed both Georgia races in order to get control, but it does have some, it's consequential because it does impact some of the uh, the power sharing on Capitol Hill in terms of committees. Uh, if Senator Warnock holds on in Georgia, then uh, Democrats would have more control on the staff level of committees and that can have a, uh, a structural impact specifically on judicial confirmations, but can also have a legislative impact as well. So it's still an important race, even though control of the Senate isn't, um, isn't hinging on what happens next week. To remind us about what we should have been expecting and what we should have been surprised about, the Senate was not one of them. Our pre-election projection was a anything from a Republican gain of two seats to a Democratic gain of a seat. And the outcome is going to fall within that. It's either going to be zero, no net change, or a Democratic gain of a seat. So this, this, was, not, um, this was not the shocking piece of what happened uh, on November 8th. If you like very fancy maps, here you go. This is the fanciest map you are ever going to see. These are just the Senate results in map, uh, in colored map format. And you'll see the Georgia, two things. You'll see the Georgia is still in yellow because it's um, yet to be decided. And there was only one flip right now. Right now, Pennsylvania is the only state, the only race that went from uh, one party control, in this case, Republicans, to Democratic control. It was Pat Toomey's seat that now Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman I was just elected to. So very little, very little turnover. Um, these were our pre-election ratings and these have held true, um, meaning that each race where we thought one party had the advantage, so the ones Republicans have an advantage of the ones on the right, Democrats on the left, those all uh, happened or uh, the results matched up with the expectation of which party had the advantage. And I remember talking with you all and saying, okay, well, whichever party control wins two out of three out of Nevada, Georgia, and Pennsylvania will control the Senate uh, in next year. And that's, Democrats have already won Nevada and Pennsylvania. They may also win Georgia, but that was the, we knew the core of the battleground from a, from a, you know, months ago, from an earlier stage before we even got to, got to the fall. Um, these are the these are the new senators uh, that are that are that will be incoming. I mentioned John Fetterman in Pennsylvania, Welch in Vermont. That really wasn't a competitive uh, a competitive race. Ted Budd holding North Carolina, the open seat for Republicans. J.D. Vance holding in Ohio. Katie Boyd Britt in Alabama. Um, she'll be the youngest Republican woman elected to the Senate at 40 years old. Uh, Mark Wayne Mullen is taking Senator Inhofe's seat, and Eric Schmidt is taking Senator Roy Blunt's seat. Um, before I, let me, let me go back. I, I won't go all the way back to the map, but I wanted to focus a little bit on the lack of turnover in races. Uh, I think one of the things that was surprising about this election was that there was a lot of uncertainty or dissatisfaction with the status quo, that voters are you know they're they're uncertain about the economy they're they are concerned about all those things we talked about from gas prices inflation cost of living uh concerned about education immigration the border crime but yet there was not a throw the bums out election that this could be if senator warnock wins in georgia then there will be that means there will be no senator who lost in a primary or a general election this cycle and that will be the first time that that has happened in the cycle in more than a century so on the Senate side, this was not a throw the bums out election. It also wasn't a throw the bums out election on the House side. In a few slides, uh, I'll get to it, but um, there will be, it looks like only nine House members lost re-election in the general election. And that will be below historical averages. There were more who lost in, in primaries because of, re, a lot of, because of redistricting um, changes or choices, but there was not a lot of turnover on, on house incumbents. And so again, that was remarkable to me that there was this environment for voters wanting change, but ultimately they decided to stick with the status quo. And um, I'm gonna keep going to talk about the house and, and there'll be another point on that, but that is one of the, my takeaways 
from, uh, from the election. Uh, in the fight for the House, uh, similar chart, you'll know, you know, in the, remember that the president's party has lost on average 30 House seats in midterm elections going back a century. Um, it looks like um, it's going to be eight or nine seats. It's probably going to be a Republican gain or Democratic loss of nine seats. So our pre-election projection was a Republican gain of 13 to 30 seats. Um, hold on, I'll come back to that in a second. And how we came up with that projection was that if both parties had won the, the races where they had the advantage based on the polling and the data that we were seeing, and then the party split the toss-ups evenly, that would have been a Republican gain of 13 seats. But we expected Republicans to win a disproportionate number of those toss-up races because undecided or independent voters looked primed. They didn't like the job that President Biden is doing. Um, they were concerned about the economy. And again, all those things we were talking about, I expected Republicans to win a disproportionate number of those toss-up races. In reality, that's not what happened. I think the biggest surprise was that independent voters nationally actually supported Democratic candidates narrowly, 49 to 47%, according to the exit polling. And that fed into Democrats winning a majority of the toss-up races, and that fed into the, the fight for the House being closer than expected. And so being, it's probably gonna be nine seats, so short of the 13 that we, short of the 13 that we saw. And, and you say, okay, well, why did independent voters do that? We're not gonna know for sure, um, but we do know at least a couple, I think there are at least a couple of things is that, first of all, voters, Democratic, uh, um, independent voters did not punish Democratic candidates for what they don't or didn't like about President Biden. That they ultimately uh, either were satisfied in, dis in voicing that disapproval in another way, or the second piece is that they were uncomfortable with the Republican alternative. I think we had a there were a lot of voters in the middle who were they don't think things are headed in the right direction, but they were uncomfortable with the alternative and ultimately stuck with the status quo. Now it's interesting to me. I went back. This is the third consecutive cycle where independent voters have supported either the president, the Democratic presidential candidate, or Democratic candidate. So I mentioned this cycle. They went 49 to 47% for Democrats. In 2020, independent voters voted 54 to 41 for Joe Biden. In 2018, they supported Democratic candidates 54 to 42. So again, three straight cycles where Democrats, uh, where independent voters supported Democrats, even though Republicans uh, did win, uh, didn't win back the House majority this cycle. Now, if you go even further back, there were one, two, three, Four consecutive cycles before that, going from 2010 to 2016, where independent voters supported Republican candidates or the Republican presidential nominee. So there is kind of a cyclical pace to this. But to me, that was interesting about independent voters that even though Republicans have reasons to be happy about what happened, there are still some concerns that they haven't closed the deal with those, um, closed the deal with independent with independent voters. Uh, I promise to go back. Um, there are still two uncalled races. One is in California's 13th district. It's it's incredibly close. I think Republicans are going to end up winning it, uh, but that still hasn't officially been called. And then in Colorado's third district, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, that race is going to an automatic recount. Um, this would have been, I think, the the biggest surprise from an individual race level. We had it rated a solid Republican, even though there was a little bit of evidence that she was in a little bit of trouble. I don't. I didn't hear anyone talking about how it was, she was going to win by. Uh, Bobert was going to win by 600 plus votes, but that is going to an automatic recount. The Democratic candidate has conceded, but uh, but that doesn't. A concession is not really what is not an official piece of the of the electoral process. It's more ceremonial. Uh, but I will point out, uh, moving forward, that with this narrow of a Congress, um, every every seat and every vote matters. Let's talk about two specific examples. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Congressman Don McEachin of Virginia um, just passed away um, a couple of days ago. Uh, and so uh, this Congress, so Democrats, there will eventually be a special election and Democrats will likely win that. It's a, it's a, 
heavily uh, Democratic district that goes from the Richmond area down south to the North Carolina border. But that will take time. There will be a vacancy there or a vote that Democrats are not going to have until that special uh, until that special election takes place. Also, um, Arizona's sixth district, you'll see that it's in, a, in that tilt R category um, where um, Republican Juan Siscomani uh, has been projected as the winner and taking over that seat from Democrats. But this is a place where um, county commissioners in Cochise County uh, are, are not certifying the election. And this is going through many legal, uh, through kind of multiple legal steps. But one of the potential ramifications of it is that actually the Democratic Secretary of State, who is actually the governor elect, Katie Hobbs, is suing the county and telling them they need to certify the election. Um, some county commissioners are saying no, but one of the, the Secretary of State's legal team has said, well, they might be forced to to finish the canvas of the state or finish the, the certification of the state without those county, without that those counties' votes. Now, that really wouldn't matter for the statewide races because um, uh, it, this is a Republican county, and so it's going to be taking away Republican votes, but it could have an impact on this sixth district race because if you remove, if you don't include those count that county's totals, then that could, could mean that Democrats hold the seat and Siskamani doesn't win. Ultimately, I'm not an attorney. Ultimately, I think that um, I expect Republicans to still win, but this is a a um, it's a messy it's a messy process. And candidly, this is also part of a projection that I'm I'm wrong. I was wrong about. I expected what's going on there in Arizona to happen in a dozen places around the country. And fortunately, we're not really dealing with that that contentiousness about certifications of elections. There's this in Arizona, there's one county in Pennsylvania um, that is going through something somewhat similar. But I just wanted to alert you to that kind of, um, that kind of piece or that, that news and what we're, what we're waiting for there. Okay, um, I'm going to, uh, this is, I'm gonna keep moving here. Uh, these are the, the nine house members that lost in the general election on the right. You'll see the ones that were defeated on the left. You can, if you really want to dive into them, uh, we can we can come back to them. But those that's what happened there. Fight for governors. We'll do this quickly. Uh, Pre-election, there were 28 Republicans, 22 Democrats. Um, this is, but now there are 20. Uh oh, hold on a second. Um, I lost my I lost my screen. Um, 22, um, but Democrats gained two governorships, even though there are a uh, Republicans still have a majority, but that doesn't that doesn't really matter in that respect. Okay, um, before we hold on one second here. All right, uh, these are these are how we had the the governor's races rated before. The only thing that I will point out is that uh, Governor Sisolak in Nevada, the Democratic governor, the, he is the only governor to lose re-election. So remember, I was talking about the lack of uh, throw the bums out. Uh, it, it held true in governor's races as well. Only one incumbent governor lost re-election, and that was Sisolak in in Nevada. Uh, we don't really have time, I think, to go through because I want to I want to get to questions. But um, these are how some of the incumbents performed, including Governor DeSantis in Florida, winning by 19 points. He may or may not be running for something later on. I don't know if you all heard about that or not. But I uh, hope you can sense some sarcasm through uh, through our go-to webinar here. Uh, in open seats for governors where there wasn't an incumbent running for re-election, a couple of historical pieces. Um, Westmore in Maryland uh, became the first black governor of Maryland and also the, only the third black governor nationwide. That was kind of a startling uh, tidbit of information for me. And then Governor Alex Kotek in Oregon and Healy in Massachusetts uh, became the first two openly lesbian candidates to be to be elected governor. So some kind of historical historical nuggets there that you can use at your at your Christmas or holiday holiday dinner. Uh, there's my email address if you're already mad at me or don't read the bottom of page two of your newsletter. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing um, stop sharing my screen. Uh, Jeremy, before we do questions, let me make let me make one other point. Um, what happened in the election is different sometimes than what the politicians think happened in the election. And I hope that 
what I'm saying happened is helpful and accurate and true, but we have to listen to what the strategists and the politicians think happened because that's what's going to guide their future behavior. It's going to guide whatever lessons that they take away, even if they're different than mine, that matters because it's going to matter with what legislation they push forward, what do they do on oversight and investigations. One of the, one of the challenges that I see Republicans facing in the House is they have to balance this you know they they have committed to helping um, helping uh, you know everyday people with their their economic concerns or just where they are uh, their their where they are uh, with the economy and in life, but also this strong desire to exercise that oversight muscle. And we're going to see investigations into Hunter Biden and, and Hunter's Biden's laptop and Secretary Mayorkas and maybe Merrick Garland and whom else and. And I'm not saying the Republicans shouldn't do that. I'm just saying there is a there is a a fear, not a fear, a there's a danger for Republicans if they get branded as the party that is only concerned with investigating the Biden and the Biden family, then they will risk being looking out of touch for not addressing the economic concerns that people were prioritizing when they um, when they voted uh, when they voted this year. So that's one thing. Again, we have to listen to the politicians to think, to hear them and say, well, okay, what did they learn from this? What did they think voters were saying? Because that is how they're going to respond and act over the next two years. I'm gonna pause. Jeremy, I, I assume we have a couple of questions, but uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I think uh, some questions are starting to roll in. Uh, thank you for, for that analysis. And uh, uh, GoToWebinar does not have a filter for sarcasm, so I think it can <laughs> Congrats also to your daughter for being elected class president. It's a lot of power, freshman class. That's a lot of a lot of power there. So we'll yes, see. Yes. All right, uh, we have a couple of questions popping in. Uh, one from Mike: uh, How do you think the election results will impact the House Financial Services Services Committee's agenda? Yeah, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna partially punt, uh, mainly punt to your team, and and I think the you know Emily will come back come on here in a little bit. Um, I what I see though is that it's going to be tough um, broadly to get big things done. I mean, we have a divided Congress. We still have a Democratic president. Uh, we've seen over the last two years, even when Democrats were technically in control of everything, it's tough to get everyone in the same party on the same page. And so um, I think broadly, I'll say that the legislative environment is going to be difficult. But I will leave. Um, I'll punt the the specifics to the committee and policy uh, to the team here in a little bit. All right, Emily, you're going to be on the clock here in a little bit. Uh, a question from Michael on the uh, the Herschel Walker you know race and the newest issue of him being a Texas resident and voting in Georgia. You know, how do you think this will affect the outcome? Yeah. Um, I'm going to I don't want to I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview. I don't want to scoop ourselves too much, but you know, we've had Georgia rated as a toss up um for I think the entire cycle. Uh we are about to or getting ready very close uh to changing our rating of the race to tilting democratic. Um please don't scoop me on this. It's nothing. We haven't even published anything on it yet, but I'm giving you a preview. I think there are multiple pieces of evidence that um Warnock has a narrow advantage heading into next week's next week's race it's not a done deal it's i think it's still going to be close and saw but when you cut when it comes to warnock finishing ahead um one of walker's strongest points was the majority right even though that that the seat mattered for control of the senate and now it doesn't it, it, that that potency is taken out of that message democrats are outspending republicans and there are issues it's a long answer to getting around to issues such as walker's residency and other things that just don't that aren't helpful, right? Walker needs kind of everything to go right in order to get over the top in in next week's uh, in next week's race. But that's the residency is just one piece that I think is is potentially holding him back from from pulling it, you know, from pulling it off. I wouldn't be shocked if Walker. I mean, Georgia is becoming one of the biggest um, swing states that we have in this country, and it, I, the the margins are very narrow for both parties in terms of high ceiling no low ceiling high floor for each candidate but um 
you know, I, I think Walker is on Walker's on defense for a running back. He's actually on, on defense in this race. There you go. Nice, nice stuff. Football analogy there. Uh, well, when, when's your newsletter come out? We won't, we won't share this recording, you know, broadly until you get your, 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 your publication out. Yeah, we should, it should be actually, um, the newsletter, it comes out on Friday afternoon, uh, but we might be posting something online sooner than that. So, uh, so stay tuned, but literally you guys are outside of uh, the inside elections team. You're, you are getting the scoop here. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions, pop them in the questions box. We've got a few more minutes before we uh, transition to, uh, you know, uh, Alta advocacy uh, issues and, and priorities. Um, a question about uh, looking ahead to the, the 24 election, you know, uh, about a week after the, these midterms wrapped up, um, Trump uh, announced he was going to be running again. You know, how has that, is this cycle just continuous, you know, and, and how do you think that these results will impact 24? Yeah, I mean, there is no off year anymore. Uh, we are we are in just a continuous cycle. And in, in Trump's official announcement, even though I would argue he's been running for years, he never really stopped running, uh, just just adds to that. Uh, I uh, there is the 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 armor kind of the Trump armor within the Republican Party has some has some holes in it. I, I think there are some Republicans who are being more outspoken than what they have been before. I do, I do, uh, it hasn't been still particularly strong or it's had certain circumstances. Let's be specific. Um, Christy Nome, the governor of South Dakota, uh, after the election, she started to be, you know, bolder about, uh, you know, Trump's not the right candidate or something that's like, okay, well, that's convenient that you waited until after getting reelected in order to, you're not going to face South Dakota voters for another four years that you make that uh, pronouncement. But even with this, um, the former president's dinners with with uh, Kanye or Ye or Ye or uh, and Nick Fuentes, the criticism of that is still not directly at Trump, right? It's sort of it's either not mentioning him by name or criticizing Fuentes, which you don't get extra points for criticizing Fuentes. I mean, if you can't do that, then then what what are what are we even doing here? But I I still until I see candidates. Um, going face to face with Trump and really taking him on, we don't really know how that's going to be because I have uh, sort of my analysis or feeling is that individual or, or base Republican voters are still more strongly behind Trump than what some of these other Republican politicians want to uh, want to admit. I think, again, the, the shine has kind of kind of kind of come off of him. Clearly, one of his takeaways was not that his some of his highest profile endorsed candidates that they lost, that they kept Republicans from getting in the majority in the Senate. I could make that case. That's not the argument. That's not the case that he's taking away from it. It's not prohibiting or, or making him think twice about running. So that's a good example of what happened in the election and what the politicians think happened are different and, and it has different um, than leads to different uh, different behaviors. But so 2024, we have a long way to go in terms of who's running. I don't think Biden's running still, even though he's says he's putting things in place. Uh, but a lot of it will be determined by candidate strength, candidate quality, and the economy. How is the economy doing? If the economy does not recover, Democrats are going to have a whole a hard time holding on. If things pick up and improve, if we are healthier, stronger, more secure as a country, then that will improve Democratic chances of holding the White House. Yep, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. Uh, one more quick question: Is it yay or ye? So, I don't know. I I'm too old to make these. <laughs> I think I'm disqualified already just from not knowing, uh, not knowing the answer to that. So I will I'll, I'll fall back on on being a middle aged dad or close to middle aged dad and not knowing. All right. Well. It's been debated in my house, so we have not came to a consensus. So, all right. Well, well Nathan, uh, thank you again uh, for offering your, your insight and your knowledge on, um, on the political landscape. Hopefully everyone gets the Inside Elections uh, publication and uh, look for that uh, posting on, online later today, tomorrow, and, and, and getting it you know, li later this week. So, um, Nathan, again, thank you for your time. Yeah, uh, thank now, you. I appreciate it. Now we'll, we'll, we will uh, turn to some of our advocacy efforts and uh, policies that impact your business. 
uh, joining us from the ALTA team, we've got uh, Chris Morton. Chris is ALTA's Senior, Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Chief Advocacy Officer. Uh, we also have Emily Tryon. Emily is ALTA's Senior Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs. And also joining us is Leah Schiff-Boss. Leah is Director of Grassroots and Political Affairs. And so Chris, welcome. And I'll turn this part of the webinar over to you three. Oh. The gremlins have muted you, Chris. There we go. No. I can't actually hear any of you. Emily, Leah, can I hear you? I'm here. Can you yep, hear here. me? Yeah. I'll go. I'll start. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, we'll let Chris figure out his microphone. Uh, every platform we use is different, so you never know where all the buttons are. Um, but thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening to Nathan. Um, if you're a TIEFAC donor, you have been receiving his newsletter this year um, and learning about his insights on the elections. Um, and I, and I mean, it was a pretty interesting year. I'm a political junkie myself, so I read that stuff all the time. Um, and I do have some information about tie pack and how uh, we fared with our contributions during the election. Um, we made a total of $742,000 in contributions to federal candidates in the past two years during this election cycle, um, and an additional 426500 to party committees and leadership PACs um, that all support federal candidates as well. Um, we fared pretty well uh, overall with all those contributions made. We gave to 151 candidates and only seven of those candidates actually lost. Um, we did have a handful of folks that we donated to as well who either ended up retiring before the election or were not in cycle in the Senate. Um, but seven losses, I think if you look over the last few election cycles, that's very low. Um, and Nathan talked a little bit about that, like very low turnover with those who were who were running. It was a lot of things remaining the same. Um, but what that means for all of us is that Alta is lucky to have a lot of our champions staying in Congress uh, for the upcoming uh, year. And that's great for us, um, as Emily and Chris will talk about what we're facing issue wise. That means we have a lot of friendly faces still on the Hill that we uh, can go talk to. They already know us. They already understand what our industry is all about. Um, and this, you know, your contributions over the last few years have really allowed us to grow these relationships. Um, so we thank you for that. Um, and then the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about all the new members of Congress that we do have. Um, there were a lot of retirements. Uh, going into this election cycle, um, whether it was in the House, a lot of Democrats retiring, knowing that they were very likely to be in the minority. Um, and if you're a House member and you're in the minority, it's really not very fun uh, because it is a majority rule. Uh, so a lot of folks retired. Um, we also had some senators retire. And there are seven new senators coming in and 79 House members. Uh, what that means for all of you out there who are interested in advocacy is that we have 86 new members of Congress we need to work with and get to know and who we need to, some of whom we need to introduce to our industry. Um, so we're hoping to have some of you do some outreach in the next few months, meet your new member of Congress or new senator, talk to them about your our industry, talk to them about the real estate economy and what you're seeing out there really important for them to learn um, but or if you have a, a relationship with some of these folks already we would love to know about that you can email me directly um, or uh, in a month or so we'll be sending out a survey about congressional relationships um, and that's where you can tell us all about who you know in the state legislature 
in the federal legislature, um, and and that helps us, you know, connect connect you with them, helps us put the right person in the room for a meeting when we've got something going on. If CFPB is making some crazy threats against us on junk fees, or uh, we're trying to get co-sponsors on a bill, you know, we need to know who to contact. So if I can pick up the phone and uh, call Chuck Kane in Ohio, I know he is friends with his new member of Congress. If I could give him a call and say, hey, he's on this committee. We need you to go meet with him and, and get him familiar with what we're working on. You know, it's really helpful that we know that in advance. But um, if you do have those relationships, let, let us know. And if you want to meet with somebody in the next few months, please reach out. Um, that's, that's hugely important to our advocacy efforts. Um, and then I'll put in a little plug for our, the advocacy summit in May. I believe it's May 8th through 10th in DC. Um, and we'll be back in person. Um, we don't know all the logistics yet on Capitol Hill, but uh, we will get you guys to the Hill in front of your members of Congress this year. And with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Emily and maybe Chris if he has a microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Wonderful. Um, before we get into kind of what we anticipate and um, expect for next year, um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about kind of where we are right now, what's happening between now and the end of the year um, in this period of time called the lame duck. Um, in this time, we really have two major packages that we're watching um, that have the potential of moving. One is NDAA that we have talked about quite a bit, the National Defense Authorization Act, um, and the other is some sort of funding package, some sort of omnibus, and what does that look like? Um, we are anticipating um, that the NDAA official conference is supposed to really take off in the next week or so. They've been pre-conferencing that bill for weeks now, and I think they're really at a, a strong point. I think that they can get that bill done. Um, the questions at this point are just what riders will be attached to the bill. And a lot of that, those kind of pieces are are still kind of under wraps. They haven't given the um, the official like final um, language that they're going to be voting on as, as this kind of moves through. But you know we're watching to see what kind of things get included in there. Um, at one point we thought maybe there was going to be some stuff on enablers and other pieces that were going to be con potentially concerning for um, for you all. But it looks like a lot of that information um, was not included in this this final package but when this comes out we'll take a look and we'll send it around and let folks know if there's things we need to be aware of but the other piece that really is still continuing um, and the conversation still continue is this funding package and the omnibus or cr or cromnibus or all those fun words that um, start throwing around you know around the fiscal year or the end of the year these days because everything gets pushed to the end of the year um, right now we have a funding bill that lasts until december 16th at that point, there will have to be some sort of kind of bill or package passed. Um, it is anticipated that it will be another short-term CR until sometime the end of December, probably budding up to Christmas, um, and kind of looking as to what can be done between now and then to really get those top line numbers agreed to so people can in those appropriations committee staff can really work through their bills to make sure their funding levels um, match within the, the funding allocated to them. At this time, it is clear that those funding levels have not been agreed to. Um, and we're hearing lots of different things. Um, I'm sure folks all over the country are hearing different things, but I think that as we get through December 6th and the Georgia runoff, I think we'll have more understanding of kind of how things are moving. Um, at least that's what we're anticipating and hoping for now. Um, potential riders that if we can get to an omnibus situation where we have those top line numbers and have a larger package, there's some potential riders that could be included in that package. Um, one of them is the safe banking. Um, there's been a lot of work. There have been a lot of um, folks working with a bipartisan group of senators um, that have really been pushing forward to try to get safe banking done this year. And I think that they're they're getting closer and closer all the time. I At this point, it's still 50-50 as to whether or not it gets included. Um, but there's been a lot of work in this space and people have really come to the middle 
to really find an avenue to move forward because they're starting to realize across the country as different states start to continue to pass um, cannabis um, legislation, whether it be medical or recreational or what it looks like, that there is a safety concern and that those monies do need to be banked in some way, shape or form. Um, there is still a lot of conversation as to whether or not that's enough and that's kind of where those negotiations continue to play. So we'll keep um, our eyes on this and let you know if there's anything um, you know, moving in that space. The other piece is something that you guys are all very well aware of and we've been all working very hard on for a couple of years now and that is secure notarization. Um, our opportunity to get this done really lands in the omnibus um, or any other kind of, um, there's different opportunities that you can move things at the end of the year that get a little wild and crazy, but we will see what happens. So we're continuing to work um, to try to get this included, working with our champions on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers to really to get this um, bill on the table as something people are considering as they move through the omnibus. Um, so those are really the two big packages. There are lots of other things happening, lots of other bills, lots of other um, challenges that Congress is currently working on, but those are the two that have the potential of carrying other pieces of legislation that would um, have um, a, an effect on, on the industry as we see it right now. And I don't know if Chris is... No. no. So that's where we are right now. Um, I don't know if we have any questions on any of that or if we wanna move into kind of what, what we anticipate for next year. Well, Emily, we did have the question that was posed to, to Nathan. If, if you want to take a, a bite of the apple a little bit on, on how you think the election results will impact the, the House Financial Service Committee's agenda. Yeah, well, I think that um, you have to look at it. The biggest thing that's going to happen um, and that we're really anticipating is um, regulatory oversight. Um, the, the White House um, and this administration has put different people in positions that um, regulatory positions and those people have spent the last, you know, year, six months or so doing different, different pieces and now moving forward. Um, having Republicans in control of the House, specifically the Financial Services Committee, there will be um, some more regulatory oversight and we'll have a lot um, of folks being called up to the Hill and talking through a lot of different pieces, which I think will be helpful uh, to get some more information on some of the issues that we've been talking about as you know, CFPB and FHFA and, and all the different programs start to come up. And I see Chris is now in I am. We've, we've, we've achieved uh, success in terms of sound in a different, a different location, so that's good. You've got to love technology in the, in the COVID era here, which I guess we're still in. Um, so the only thing I, I would add about just sort of as we look ahead into to next year, um, I think, you know, something Nathan said resonated um, from, from my perspective, which is how parties perceive the election results, because I think that, and then you look to the fact that we're two years away from a presidential election, and you combine those two things, and I think that it's going to have a lot of impact on how this how this all plays out. I think, you know, as Emily um, talked about, the the fact of the matter is there won't be uh, because both sides will sort of, I think, to some degree, misinterpret what the voters um, said. Democrats saying, you know, to one extent that they've got more of a quote unquote, you know, mandate and Republicans saying that there's still a significant amount of the electorate that is um, concerned and opposed to where the administration is going. I think that works against each other in, in finding common ground on legislative initiatives. And so, you know, you had one party control, um, which helped with some of the initiatives that were uh, accomplished over the last couple of years under under the administration and on the Hill, um, although many of those were bipartisan, and I think that just starts to work against itself. So we're not going to see major legislative packages. Um, not that things won't get done, uh, but they have to be significantly bipartisan um, to begin with. Um, you know, moving from there, I think the other piece of this um, that comes into play. Uh, is that, um, you know, the oversight function, uh, I think as Emily mentioned, becomes 
you know, an important um, lever for um, House Republicans. Um, and I think, you know, what, as we look at this from the industry's perspective and, and where we hope to achieve some, uh, some impact in an environment where legislative initiatives aren't moving, the oversight function is important. And I think, and, and I think uh, hope that we can use it for policy purposes in a way that really gets to important questions um, that the House Financial Services should be asking, uh, for instance, on things that you know, many of you have been focused on with us on uh, oversight of uh, attorney opinion letters, uh, as an example, and um, the value of title insurance and how uh, consumers are protected uh, through property rights. Um, so we're going to have some opportunities as an industry um, to leverage relationships on both sides, but certainly through the oversight function um, in the House, it's going to be a, a, a big part of our advocacy efforts. Um, and then I'll say, you know, the other, the other uh, flip side of that equation is the regulatory apparatus will accelerate. Uh, so we can expect that the work of the CFPB will you know, ratchet up on a number of fronts, including in the mortgage space. Uh, we will see uh, the work of the FHFA continue. Uh, entities like um, you know, FinCEN will continue their work sort of um, to some degree on a paper. Um, and we've partnered with them well. But a lot of our time and attention and effort you know, from a day-to-day -day perspective will pivot in many respects to working even more closely with the regulators and using the, the legislative process or the oversight function in a way that um, helps us advocate on behalf of your interests. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of the macro view, I, I think, from my perspective, that is going to be really important that we, uh, that we exercise well. All right, just a reminder, if anyone has any questions for Emily, uh, Chris, who's Leah as well, uh, <laughs> submit them in the questions box. Uh, Chris, you touched on the CFPB, you know, any yeah. insight as to, you know, where the Bureau is in their analysis of, of, of their fees and, you know, what they've labeled junk fees and, and where we are in that? Yeah, they obviously have uh, done an open request for information, which we uh, contributed, you know, our perspective on as it relates to so-called junk fees, which we don't believe, um, you know, our industry uh, should be within that um, sort of nomenclature. Um, you know, this is an ongoing um, process. They haven't uh, really put forward, at least in the mortgage space, any specific regulatory rule uh, or proposal. And I don't know that they will. I think this is more of an exercise in collecting information that, you know, that's going to suit um, their objectives. Um, um, hopefully, we can collaborate, you know, on things like, uh, as we have in the past, imp improvements to consumer education and opportunities for um, for us to uh, perhaps, you know, improve uh, and uh, clarify disclosure. Um, uh, regimes and those kinds of things. So we've we've had some productive discussions with CFPB. We'll see where they go with that. But it is um, it is a priority when you see what happened a couple of weeks ago. I think at the White House, where President Biden came out and they actually had a, a CFPB and now the FTC is involved uh, in in their version of um, looking at so-called junk fees. Uh, and both the, the head of the CFPB and the head of the FTC were at the White House with the president, and he himself was talking about it. So that just gives you an indication of the level to which this has arisen um, in terms of the, the policy discussion, and I think it will just continue to be high profile, and so we've got to continue to do what we're doing, which is engaging directly with those agencies and, and making our, our case. Yeah, it definitely what you said, engaging with, with those agencies and, and also an opportunity for our members and everyone on the call to continuously, you know, try and educate the consumer. Uh, Fannie Mae just issued uh, latest results of a survey that uh, looked at how often uh, consumers shop for, a, shop for a mortgage. The data hasn't changed over the past eight years. Um, still only about a third shop for the mortgage. They also did some analysis on how many consumers 
shop for tie to our closing services only uh, it was 90 91% don't shop for title services they rely on, on the recommendation of, of other professionals but what that says is there's a lot of opportunity to get that out in front explain what you do explain the fees and you know help bring the consumer along and and one of the just to to talk to that point jeremy one of the things that we you know we've tried to do more more and more um and it's exemplified by a partnership we recently had and hopefully some of you saw saw the webinars we did with the department of housing and urban development and their nationwide network of housing counselors to talk about not only the value of title insurance as a product, but the importance of understanding um, all of the facets of, of title insurance, not only the need, but the provisions, um, and working with title professionals, such as our members, um, to you know, ask questions, to um, you know, seek um, information. Uh, so we're, we're really hoping that um, you know, cabinet agencies like HUD and, and other departments of uh, the federal government, you know, can be um, can be good partners with our industry as we uh, try to achieve similar objectives, which is you know making sure consumers are informed and that they're protected at the end of the day. Yeah. All right. Uh, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, uh, pop them in, in there, and we'll, we'll we'll pitch them over uh, before we wrap up. Emily, I don't think it'd be a webinar presentation for us if we didn't actually touch on wire fraud a bit. You know, do you want to you know, share a little bit about uh, our advocacy efforts on that on that front? Yeah, we continue to um, to work to really um, shine the light on the wire fraud issue and really amp up the education in that space. One of the things that we recently have um, gotten is um, a public um, report from the FBI that addresses wire fraud. And in the next you know, coming weeks and months, I think we're really going to focus in on what does that report say and what can we do? How can we work with um, our champions um, on the Hill to really find an opportunity to, to highlight this even more? So I think that um, is a great um, thing to focus on here at the end because I think that's one of the things we'll really be trying to um, push forward on in in the coming um, year. So we're excited about that. I think we have some positive um, kind of outreach on that, and and we'll we'll be in touch with everybody um, on that issue. But we're excited to be able to really um, ramp up our efforts there and move forward. Okay. All right, Jeremy, I also I also think one one other thing it wouldn't be uh, appropriate webinar. Um, you know, in recognition, if we didn't congratulate Emily on her second year in a row uh, for her top lobbyist uh, award. So um, it's a good opportunity to do that as we end this year to really thank her for her work. Yeah. Thank did, you. Did you see my notes, Chris? Because, yeah, I was going to mention that. But yes. No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Lock each other the punch. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Congrats, Emily. And, and yeah, Emily definitely knows knows our members, you know, business and, and we're you should be proud of having her represent your interests. Um, let's see, we do actually have a question from Alex. To your point, do you see any issues with the government labeling items as junk? So, uh, let me read this first before I ask it. Alex, I'll, uh, we'll, I'll connect with you offline here. So uh, we are at the top of the hour. Um, Emily, Chris, thank you for an update on, on policies and important to our, our, our members. Uh, as Leah also mentioned, uh, in, uh, great opportunity to uh, establish new relationships. If you do have, have any, please reach out, let Leah know, let, let Emily, Chris know, and, and, and we can uh, um, take advantage of that and, 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 and connect with them. Uh, if you missed any parts of today's webinar, or if you think others in your office would benefit from listening, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a recording will be available on Alta's website at alta.org forward slash webinars. You'll also get an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. Uh, before wrapping up, we do need to thank SoftPro once again for sponsoring today's webinar. And with that, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. Take care, everyone. <laughs>